So welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Mark Deschwinitz. I'm here with Tom McPhee. Tom, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Mark. I, I actually came there in gifts, too. I know you kind of see it in front of here. Um, but I want to really thank you because I do appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity and just the friendship that we've started to develop. I appreciate that. This is um, what got me started this whole thing in the first place. So I want to give you a copy of my movie, American Opera. Wow, thank you. That's that's awesome. I'm definitely going to watch this. I'm a big documentary fan, so I look forward to that. Excellent. Good. Uh, well, Tom and I first met about a year ago. It was at a Google for Nonprofits. Um, I was a volunteer. Tom was here in the office in Ann Arbor. And I, I saw a video of what he does. It was a film about himself running down Gratiot Avenue in Detroit, um, documenting dogs and the problems that some of them are facing based, based on abuse and other problems like that. Um, I was impressed by what you did, Tom, so thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure, and I can't believe it's been, what, seriously, a year since that took place. Was it really last fall, last late fall? Yeah, something like that. Oh, my so, goodness. Yeah, and what we really want to learn about today is what you do as a filmmaker making documentaries like this and how we can learn as Googlers and others watching how to tell great stories through video um, other ways like that. So first, maybe you can just tell us what you do in general as a documentary filmmaker. Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I think, a very contemporary hybrid. I've been um, fancying about the whole independent film scene for a long time. I uh, actually started um, my career uh, in technology. I worked for Hamilton Avnet and then Avnet Computer and I was selling big box computers um, coupled with you know, really expensive software and that afforded me to get involved with creating my own software company uh, in the early 90s and the whole reason for me was to get closer to filmmaking um, and initially for many years that, that process was making interactive content for commercial um, uh, entities like Ford and Saturn and so on here in a, in a car town. Um, but I always wanted to be involved with the more commercial or more available you know, form of entertainment. And I like documentaries a lot too. Um, but I was able to uh, make some independent films. I was able to create an independent film tour called Flix Tour um, that toured around the country. We actually um, helped, in essence, find Paul Feig. Paul Feig, who now has got Ghostbusters that's coming out. He did Bridesmaid, he did Spy. Um, he, he really, his coming out was Freaks and Geeks. And he wrote that while he was on my film tour, Flicks tour at that time. And um, Kevin Smith actually started doing his college touring because he appeared at a couple of our um, presentations with Flicks tour out of the college circuit. And, we were always mobbed when he was there. Now he's making like 50,000 up per three hours, to, you know. Be nice. And I know it's crazy. But for me, I, I, I was always fascinated with, with telling stories and um, being able to communicate. You know, I always thought I was going to be a baseball player. Since I couldn't be a baseball player forever, what do you do? You know, and as a storyteller, I can tell stories all my life. You know, the rest of my life. In this realm, though, in telling stories visually, um, it has been a 25 year journey for me to go from producer, hiring people and interacting with people to make movies. The very first movie I made um, was with Bruce Campbell. It's a little independent film that people know horror films. And we just lost Gunnar Hansen, who was the original Texas um, Chainsaw Massacre Leatherface, but he was our star in our movie. You know, when you're doing a horror film, you need to have some kind of icon. Yeah. But um, Gunnar just passed away, rest his soul. But I went from that to, um, you know, kind of going through a bunch of gyrations of trying to understand what I wanted to do in this realm. And um, in 2005, as soon as Hurricane Katrina hit um, and everything took place there, I'd been doing this type of stuff for 15, 20 years. And I, I found myself being in that's, that's right in New Orleans immediately afterwards. We thought we were going to help people, and in a, a very specific moment in time, it was like a flash. It literally just happened, and I saw like the next three, five years in front of me, um, and that was 
uh, I thought I was seeing our evolutionary like essence, how we evolve in front of my eyes in this catastrophic environment. People were trying to do good. So you had a bunch of people trying to do good with people. But then you had this mass of humanity that came down to try to do good with animals too. And when I started to look, you know, at how this whole thing played out, um, I thought this is a, a, amazing because the facade of everything and, and what we are was ripped away and you could actually see you know, people's essence and their humanity and the, you know, and I, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to, you know, figure out a way to spend time with this realm, to tell stories and, for me, uncover our evolution in real time, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 not in the future looking back at us, but right now, what do we do? So this film, an American opera, it's about people saving their pets during after Hurricane Katrina, is that correct? Well, actually, it's about um, the, the the disaster within a disaster, mm -hmm. and what happened was in this disaster, about three days, four days into it, um, there was a forced evacuation because people hadn't left for a lot of different reasons, and many of those people, a huge portion of the population, because they can't take their pets, mm -hmm. and so when they were forced to evacuate they were forcibly separated from their pets and there were literally tens of thousands of animals of all sorts left behind. And there was all kinds of really horrific things happening there too. I know we've heard about the situation with the people being gunned down on the bridge, but in St. Bernard Parish, for two whole days, the police you know, were going up and down the streets shooting everybody's dogs. They actually sent out texts you know, to their fellow because in those situations, firemen, police around the world, they all band together, hey, what do you need? And there's texts of the police going, hey, we need more bullets. We ran out of bullets shooting all the dogs in the streets. Oh, that's terrible. And it's a story that people don't really realize, you know, that, that and I didn't either. And this is the thing that kind of, you know, cauterized this, or, you know, kind of made this real for me. And, and that is the fact that, there is this soul bond connection with people, with animals, their family members, and you can't just separate. So many things go wrong at that point when you try to separate families, you know? So when you went down to Louisiana after this disaster, did you know that you'd be making a documentary about no. this incident? Or you just went down and said, this is something terrible happening, I need to figure out how I can help you? We heard Mayor Nathan basically pleading for help on that, I think that uh, September 1st, like a couple days after the storm, and uh, he was pleading for assistance, you know, in essence crying on the radio. And I heard this a couple days later when I was getting ready for something else, and it just, I, I just felt like I have to do something. I'm at a moment in time, I can go address this. Um, I'm going to, you know, go down there. We thought we were going to be helping pull people, dead bodies out of the, I had no concept about animal related. Oh, this is a new world. So this was really a foray into animal related film? Absolutely. And this was about 10 years ago? Yes. Okay. Ten, you know, when it, when it happened, when I went down, it was early September 2005, and I had been doing this type of, you know, production producer and so on, but, but I, I ended up participating on two Animal Planet specials about the event, a National Geographic special, and uh, that, uh, excuse me, a, 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 a NOVA. Mm -hmm. their uh, natural history series, uh, it was on there too. And, um, you know, and they were looking at certain aspects of the story and, and I was seeing a much richer story down there and so I wanted to tell the greater story and that, that's why the, 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 the movie came out of it mm -hmm. because there was quite a bit of material that I participated in that came in, but I needed to tell, mm -hmm. you know, my story, what I saw, right. this ongoing situation. Once, once all the dogs, you know, in essence, or animals were scattered about, you know, as people were fostering them around the country, um, and then and then people were were working behind the scenes around the country, going, oh, I, I couldn't have been there, but maybe we can help reunite animals. Then you had this mass of people trying to find these dogs, and so our photographs, about ten thousand of them that we shot immediately when we got down there, were used to start to put 
all the people and animals back together. And then you had a whole other disaster because the people who were fostering didn't want to give the animals back. They go, oh, these people left those animals. We, they shouldn't you know, have that. So there was so many things, there were so many layers going on to this in humanity. And I, again, I, you know, it, it, it created a whole bunch of content for history. Um, an American opera and all of its contents, by the way, is going into the Library of Con Congress. <coughs> and, and there's just, you know, there's a, it was a very important period in time. The animal welfare and animal rescue realm really blew up at that point. And there's two con contributing factors. Um, social media, because Facebook, Craigslist was huge, you know, impact on that environment. Um, and then this event, this, this massive event that, you know, people saw unfold on there. They'd seen five years before to, you know, 9-11. Oh my God! And I, you know, what you what do you do about it? And here they watch this event unfold over a couple of days, and they go, "That's close enough that I can drive there." Even if they're somewhere in Quebec or mm -hmm. Washington State, people were driving there wow. to help out in tens of thousands. And I just, I was, I was part of that, you know, collective that was down there that had those experiences, and then had those experiences for many months. Then I interacted with a lot of those people again to watch their evolution, and it's been it's been amazing. Um, just this year, they had the 10 year anniversary, and again there were 10 year anniversary events. I was filming something else, so I couldn't go this year, but I filmed a bunch of five year reunion stuff. I was down there. I was actually down there at that time covering the BP disaster in the Gulf for World, for WA2S Films. So that's what kind of initiated everything and then a publisher friend of mine said hey you know we really want to get behind what you're doing um, and we think we can get behind it more if you started a nonprofit." Hmm. okay and I thought about that and I said oh that's a good idea I'd love to because I don't want to go and fund each individual thing we need to be able to figure out how to create an entity to fund all the things I want to be able to be in a situation where our organization can at six months or six um, hours notice after a major disaster go off into that disaster. You know, as BP, we were in Fukushima, we were in Haiti, you know, studying the relationships with this stuff. But, uh, you know, this publisher friend of mine said, look, you need to, to do this. And, and uh, I thought about it, I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And the, then I told her the name, and she's like, what is that? Like, because it's so long. You the know, World you're, Animal Yeah, it's like, like it's a mouthful and a half, right? She, it's like, why don't you just call it like Dogville? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> It's like, well, no, I wanted to do something a little bit more. We don't want to do just funny animal thing. We want to do stuff that's really meaningful here. And unfortunately, I want to pack all of what we do into that name. So World Animal Awareness Society, which says exactly what we are. Um, and, we what, and what's the goal of the World Animal Awareness Society? To be able to tell stories that human, contemporary human-animal interaction to try to understand our evolutionary arc. You know, I mean, it, it really boils down to that simple of a thing. And our URL, um, which is an homage to Ann Arbor 2, is wa2s.org. Anybody who knows Ann Arbor knows it's A2 or A squared. Mm -hmm. our, our, instead of Ann Arbor, our A squared is animal awareness. You know, so it's wa2s.org. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So before we learn more about wa2s.org, can you share with us how you develop a story, such as when you made an American opera? What was your process for saying, you know, in a 45-minute, an hour-long documentary, here's the start to finish of a story? Just you know, more for education for the viewers. How do you tell a story like that? I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time now, and I'm starting to figure out, you know, all the different processes and how to use, you know, what I'm doing. And you asked me early on about being a filmmaker. I think I'm a contemporary filmmaker because I'm making for the internet, I'm making for commercial, I'm making for television, theatrical, and and so they're all different, but they all kind of contribute to each other. Um, and a lot of filmmakers don't really understand that. By the way, I love. Love, love, YouTube, Google, the Google family. Um, it's been a great partnership as a Google nonprofit. And YouTube is just such a powerful entity to be able to create my own channel and be able to communicate what's going on in the world. You know, it's been um, truly phenomenal. But for me, 
you know, it, there has been this evolution, and I think it starts with understanding where's your target, mm -hmm. and then what what's your medium, and so that that whole you know idea of are we are we really targeting the internet? Are we targeting, you know, like the Martian looks very different than than American Opera. You know, there's a whole different thing in terms of cost and everything that, that goes into it. And so for me, as a documentary filmmaker, I don't want to create constructs. I want to observe the world, and then I want to kind of assemble based on, on what I see and what I've assimilated of that information. An American opera, we, I was just talking about this with somebody recently about, you know, when do you get into you know, being able to talk about facts and figures with a documentary. When is it uh, a good situation to look at maybe the emotional aspects of the storytelling? And for an American opera, because the, the facts weren't known, it was such a big, crazy mess that you couldn't really sort through what was going on, and the emotions took, took huge precedence. The idea was here, you know, we just happen to be at ground zero when, when those things happen, and you start to kind of work your way out. Okay, where are the story threats? What's going on? You know, and that's when we found that the dogs were being murdered in St. Bernard Parish. That's when we find that people are returning dogs to the other. That's when we go to chase after um, um, Marilyn Pickens, T. Boone Pickens' wife, was flying dogs out by the, 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 the Airbus load, you know, and so we went down to the airport and we're filming. So you just, you, you go, oh, there's something going on here, and you start to kind of expand out. Um, so that's how an American opera went. When I look at, at doing doc projects, though, I, I want to take that process. Um, and, and the reason is, is because every time that I started to go and like examine these things, my brain starts to tell me, oh, this is what I'm seeing, oh, this is what I'm seeing, this is kind of what I'm looking at. And as I look at it more, it's like, oh, no, 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 there's something else going on. There's another layer that we've got to peel back. And, and time, you know, and I appreciate doing long form, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to specialize in short form too for the internet. We shot something yesterday afternoon. It's on the top of our page right now, wa2s.org. Uh, a bunch of puppies and dogs being rescued. It's a five minute piece. We flipped it around. We're trying to understand you know, how to best do, you know, look and feel and aesthetic and tell a story. and connect with that, and for us it also helps boil down what might work in a television piece, what might work in a, in a film festival piece, and they're different. Um, you know, so, so I've started to kind of look at how can we just shoot as much as we can, and then start to chase after the different threads, and the ones that stick to each other, you put them together. Hmm. So your approach is really go gather the information, yeah. just see what's happening, and then figure out what's the story here, uh, as opposed to coming in with a predetermined plan, structure. One of the first things that we did with uh, World Animal Awareness Society was make a presentation to um, Rotary in Saline, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And and I explained what, and you, people can find it on our YouTube channel, you know, kind of the, there's a three part thing about, you know, why we're doing it. And, and for me, it's about documentum. Document, what is that? The lot, it's kind of the Latin from where documentary comes from. Documentary is a very contemporary word, it's like maybe a hundred years old or so. Um, but with the moving, and it's, and it's really come forth with the moving image. But going back 2,000 years and more, the idea of documentum is telling stories to, in essence, to learn from, you know, stories to kind of educate, to pass on, you know, knowledge to allow you to move forward, you know, progressively, happily. You know, there's this, this idea of documentum, you just say what happens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with documentary, especially now, we're trying to confect too much. And, and my belief is, I, and the whole reason I started this was to try to cut through all of that stuff, all the static, to figure out what's real. What, what, is, what is really going on here and, and not what they're selling me or not what this place is, is selling me. I want to know really what the deal mm -hmm. is. You know? Is this a belief you have or is this shared amongst all of the main documentary filmmakers when you go to a Sundance Film Festival or something like that? Um, do you 
share this belief with others? I think it all depends on, on well, you, you sometimes, but I think it all depends on how successful you are. Now, you know, I, I love watching all different and looking at all different types of documentary fil filmmakers for all different types of reasons. I like Michael more just for how commercially successful the guy is. Amazing. Now, some of his work has been really phenomenal, too, in terms of how he's digging up stuff, but that's a certain type of documentary. Then you've got Alex Gibney, you know, who's won some Oscars, and he's got a very specific look to him. Morgan Spurlock's got a look. You know, um, I've got a lot of people that I interact with in the, in the filmmaking community, and, you know, they all kind of, you know, some focus in rock documentaries, so that kind of has that flavor. But everything's evolving, because right now the tools are evolving. You know, we're not, we're not working with... Re the, the fact that I can be... Sorry, but I'm killing my mic, too. An opposite brain person coming from the sales side of things to be able to now really kind of fully made the adjustment to be a creative person is because the tools exist. Mm -hmm. The digital tools, the cameras, you know, we're using, uh, I'm going to bring this up now so I don't forget about it. You know, I wanted to have some of our filmmaking have a, a much more um, dynamic look to it. And so now we're using drones. That's awesome. This is DJI's Inspire One. It's super easy to use. I easy to fly, no accidents, crashing here. Well, this is the second one. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> However, they are super easy. It's five minutes out of the box. Um, they've got a lot of stuff built in, and their firmware keeps getting better in terms of being able to do it. It's got follow technology now. You can actually lock in waypoints and you can focus. They have a new camera system, too. But for a filmmaker that's always been pedestrian and underground, and, and wanting to get into lots of places, especially since we started the American Strange project. We're chasing dog, we're trying to get into areas that you just can't get into. You want something like this. But prior to this, this past year, the technology was, was too hard to do in a run and gun fashion like we do it here. <laughs> I throw up at the truck, I pull it out. If I have it already kind of pre-configured, all I do is set my, my compass. It's kind of like I do this little dance. Um, and I launch. So I get a GPS. Really a game changer for you, huh? Huge. Because it pokes into a lot of different places. We've been able to chase and find dogs this way, you know, as part of the, the work that we're doing. But it also gives us really dynamic picture making capabilities too. You know, the the, the, the sunset. So yeah, it's totally game changing. But the thing is, everybody and their brother's gonna have one. You know, and they are already starting to have them. And you're going to see them everywhere, but then there's going to be something else. And for us, that's something else right now, as we're doing a series with um, teen girls that involves animal rescue and technology. And we want to use the Rico Theta 360S, and we want to attach it to the girls. It's a 360. It's your Google Earth, you know, your Google Street camera, you know, brought right. down into miniature size that you can attach to somebody. And you, you know, 360 is the thing right now. YouTube allows us to share 360 video and to interact. And so, so they wear it on a helmet, or how does you this know, work? We'll, we'll probably figure out the best way to wear it. It might be on a chesty, it might be a helmet, but we'll, we'll figure that out. And it's, my guess is it'll probably be up front, that way the person is in the action, but then the person looking at the material. So we'll, we'll, we'll film conventionally certain parts of the series, but then you can go online and have this more immersive experience, especially if you're a girl, to, to you work with this material like these other girls are doing by being able to explore in the video. It's, it's accessible right now. As a matter of fact, we, we're looking for donors. We're trying to you know, get um, four cameras. They're like $350 a piece to get this 360 um, HD video. It's crazy. Technology is very, very available. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, you've mentioned the evolution of more traditional media, television, to YouTube, the Internet. Um, how have you changed your content or the way you do your work because of YouTube and the Internet? I'm a pivot genius. I love technology and I've always loved technology. I've had early everything. I had one of the first CD players. I had, you know, early everything, you know, that's been coming out since I was growing up. I, um, um, I was uh, the, the very end of the baby boomer, you know, I'm a 
before, baby. And, you know, I was, we had phones with cords, you know, in the kitchen. Um, I actually, one of my first professional jobs was selling, um, I'm killing my mic, I'm sure. One of my, one of my first jobs was selling cellular phones very early on. I was selling those brick phones for $3,000 a pop. Wow. I love technology. And right now, there's so many different ways to apply it. So to me, it's not even about keeping up. It's, a, it's about like being this joyous place because I can find more things to do what we're doing better, cheaper, faster. You know, I want to be the vice mm -hmm. in this realm. As a matter of fact, we've been talking with Shane um, Smith and Vice. We've been talking with a few other broadcasters about ramping up our, our content production. And, um, you know, we want to be broadcasting 24-7 around the world. And there's so much content on YouTube right now. How do you cut through that clutter and stand out? I've seen some of your videos have hundreds of thousands of views and organically, I believe. Yeah, well, you know, it's building relationships. So, um, you know, part of that is that we put out some content. Someone would think well enough of it that they'd start to carry it. And using the analytics, you know, YouTube's got some great analytics. Google has great analytics. We can actually really understand who's, you know, who's using those videos, who likes them, um, and then we can go and cater them. In our situation, you know, we, we communicate out to about 185 um, different, for the dog side of things, digital publishers, and, um, you know, that over time have carried our content. And some of them do really well. Some of them are big, you know, pretty big digital publishers, little things which ranks really high right now in terms of the mobile world. Um, uh, the animal rescue site is a, is a monster in terms of that. It's part of the Greater Good organization just on their animal rescue site Facebook page. It's like 6 million, but very active viewers. Mm -hmm. um, Rough Life, I think, is one of the videos you were just recently talking about. Just past a half million views in the last six weeks. Um, and it did exceedingly well. You know, they, they did 150,000 shares in like three days off of that one. But then, that's what happens too. In the viral sense, we are absolutely selling some of our content through these channels now. And how you set them up, how you build them, the cards that you use, the meta tags that you use, the titling. People will notice in our titles that they're longer titles, but they're all they're all very descriptive. Mm -hmm. You know, puppy in pipe, terrified. You know, so it's all these very descriptive words that that help generate and make those other connections. And once we get to a certain point with each of our videos that goes out to a pipeline, get to a, a point, then it starts to like do a regular like wavelength of content. Of, and I don't know if it's you know the, how people are finding it, the tags and so on. You know, so our videos then start to just have be these little engines that just kind of start to continue. But you got to get to a certain point, and there's a I don't know what that is just yet. What that is, and where they start to just roll. Mm -hmm. you know? How do you know when you're succeeding? You have your subscriber base is going up, more views, and what's ultimately your goal there with awareness? You know, um, our, our goal really is to try to make it very easy, like ESPN, to look into this realm and to sort through what's real and what's not. I mean, they're, they're kind of my first you know, entity that they look in, they're omnipresent, they deal with sports. I think this is as big of a market segment that's heavily underserved because it, it hasn't been served properly. The producers in the past or the broadcasters in the past, they, they become somewhat users of the content and then users of the environment. We don't want to do that. We, we actually have a no touchy, we, we, we are banned from interacting with animals whatsoever. You know, our objective is to communicate all of the stories out there of all the nonprofits that are doing righteous work, and there's, there's literally tens of thousands of them. Um, for us, when we start to look at what they do, the interactions that they have, and we start to build stories around them, then we start to create that impact for them, for the people that are watching the content, for us to build the base of, of broadcasters and production partners that come to us. Because we monetize what we're doing in a lot of different ways. You talk about success. What's successful? For us, our numbers of views are exceedingly high for our subscribers. We're going to hit about 13,000 subscribers here shortly. We're working with a consulting company right now, um, and our goal is by this time, uh, September of next year, 
um, to be at 100,000 subscribers. So we've got like 87,000 to go in like 10 months. So that's one way to measure it. But for us, it's also donations. Are we, are we, are we generating the donations that we should through these programs? Everything that we do is generated from outside income. Whether we license content, um, whether we do work for hire, so someone might go, hey, we need this kind of stuff. Everything then goes back into World Animal Awareness Society and WA2S Films, so we can actually tell stories about all these other organizations that, that have no communications you know, entity. They, they rely on someone like us. We want to you know, be vice ESP and National Geographic. Five years from now, when we have this conversation, I expect it to be in one of the YouTube auditoriums on one of the coasts, mm -hmm. and we're greeting like so many people because we've been then broadcasting for a year already, 24-7, and we've got our mass audience that we can mm -hmm. tap into. So you mark my words. Yeah, great. That's right. exciting. Yeah. Let's talk about your lifestyle a little bit as um, capturing all this film. I imagine you're on the road quite yes. a bit. Um, what is that like for people that are used to a nine to five job? No. Um, how does that differ for you? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. Um, tell tell us what your typical look, work there's, looks like. There's no such thing. I, I burn through houses and wives and girlfriends, and I am very happy to say um, I am in a really happy point in my life because um, the love of my life happens to be also a partner in crime and loves being on the front lines here capturing this stuff. Um, yesterday, uh, Sunday mornings are normally like go to the movies because it's, you know, you go to rave on the um, first movie of the day, it's like five bucks, real really cheap for a you know, first run movie. And uh, I think we wanted to see Bridge of Spies and kind of break down some of the film and you know, just you know, look at it, watch the movie, enjoy it, but also kind of look at it as filmmakers. And instead, because it was so nice, we decided to go and film this rescue of 13 dogs, 6 puppies, which is now at WA2S.org, because we wanted to actually practice our filmmaking skills and work with this new camera. Um, there is no, I have, from what I understand, we all die. I have a limited number of days between now and then. And I have a lot of stuff that I want to do, and there's a lot of things that I need to learn, especially as we roll into some of this new technology and we're using some online platforms and we're, you know, we're smushing it all together. So um, don't expect like golf trips, bass fishing. I used to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I used to ski. I used to go fishing all the time. I used to play 30, 40 rounds of golf. You know, I used to travel. My travel is into a danger zone to film these interactions. And I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I, I live for this stuff. That's great. You have definitely a lot of passion about this, I can tell. I have seen you in some look like dangerous neighborhoods in some of your videos. Yep. Are you ever scared? Do you feel like you're in danger? Not in the moment. And, and, and a lot of times, a lot of disturbing situations too. And I filter everything through lens. The idea for me is I, I need to focus on what I'm doing because I want to be able to look at this now afterwards, like American Opera. So we, we captured like hundreds of hours of stuff. We're, we're seeing, you know, footage of, of police officers shooting dogs. It's just really horrific stuff. And then I've got to go edit this, you know, for a couple of years. The first six months of editing that, you know, everything kind of caught up to me. So when you're out there, you're just doing whatever, and it's like all. And then, and then you get into the edit suite, and you get in, and then things stop, and then you start to start to see everything, and you're building this thing, and then everything that, that you were kind of running from and filtering through catches up. And I, I was knocked out. I, I cried every day for probably 45 minutes every day. When it first started happening, I was like really freaked out. And then I just let it happen. Every day it was like, okay, we do that. And it actually led to the creative stuff that came out of that. In American Opera, totally would not have happened if I didn't have this like total you know meltdown. But I've I've figured out how to kind of you know deal with that stuff and, and to sort through. But there is you can't do this stuff part time. We're we're putting out a lot of content. We've got very aggressive goals. We have a lot of people that are getting behind what we're doing. Um, you know we're interacting with um, HBO and, and Plimsoll Productions and Nat Geographic and, and all these others. And there is no this is what we do. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so what, what, what would you be doing if WA2S um, 
graduated, do you have any other projects that you want to work on, or do you plan to stay with this uh, organization well, for the next Well, yeah, see, that's years. the thing. The whole idea was to take this and to build this foundational thing so we can then jump into anything, anywhere. Make you know? up yeah. yeah, yeah, we're pitching an incredible show with this guy called um, Steve Hendy on Shark Online. This guy is, has been incredible, taking on very powerful people. Right now he's been taking on the United States Senator Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma. Um, on 9-11 this year he ran like the tenth of his canned pigeon shoots where they bring a thousand pigeons, they throw them up and they just shoot them all and then they pitch them into a pit and burn them all. And so these guys have been after them for a couple of years. And this year, you know, they were flying a drone to capture whatever. And someone from the Inhofe, you know, collective shot down the drone. I mean, these are, and then a bunch of other federal legal things. We're trying to get Steve on as a contributor to the John Oliver show uh, on Sunday nights. Um, he's extremely serious. He's a ball buster. And we think it would be almost a great foil because it would be fun to almost have John Oliver play with these things, how he does, and still push you know, some of the agenda. Um, you know, there's there's so much mm -hmm. going on at this realm, Mark. I mean, I'm I'm so so right now we've we've done a number of different things over the last couple of years. We've we have a focus on emergency disaster response, um, which I want to really ramp up. Um, and we've we've been focusing on what I call the American Strays umbrella programs. Operation Houston, Good Pet Garden Lesson Plans, American Strays Canine Survey, you know, bringing in science to really then build stories around, but we're still putting out science. You know, we're actually surveying these places and, and providing real data, you know, to help them make some decisions. So this has been a big initiative for four years. The next one that we've been we've been kind of messing with a little bit, and it goes to our Steve Hindy, the shark, um, you know, relationship is the use of animal in sport. So if I was to say a, another big umbrella, it would be everything that you can imagine of where man fits with animal in any kind of sporting situation, whether it's bullfighting or, or derby fishing or rattlesnake roundups or you know snapper fests or pig wrestling. A lot of these things we've already done some filming. I'm fascinated of how we have these physical interactions with it. And, and then probably once we kind of get a handle on that too, only because it's such a massive like environment and I probably need to bring in some outside specialists, is the is the whole idea of food. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole vegan I don't I have no concept of vegan and, and vegetarian and that. And I keep reaching out to the vegan community and they all just say it's a, you know it's, I don't get I I would love to have some some help really breaking down the intrigue and the mystique of it. But to me, that's such a big thing to chase after. I want to get these other big things out of the way for us before we get after Makes that. Makes sense. Yeah, that's a yeah. big topic. It's huge. And, you know, it's, you're talking about the food for most of the world, and, and it's, it's a big thing. And I, 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 don't, I, I, I need Not years to started. still think about, like, how do we, you know, mm -hmm. really get after and do it justice, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, last topic before we have Q&A, if, if anyone in the audience has a question. Um, let's talk about the Michigan economy, your Ann Arbor based, Detroit based. Um, how important is it for you to be in Michigan and capturing stories in the area? I am from Michigan. My family helped settle the town of Dearborn, um, where I grew up. And there's, I, I have a lot of parents in town. Most of us have now all moved away from Dearborn. Um, you know, there's, there's something about Michigan. I, I've had opportunities to move. Um, you know, to be in different places. And we have a presence on both coasts. We have editing and sales in New York and editing and sales in, in LA as well. Um, you know, but I, I, I'm almost done with the winters, so I can see the migration. You know, maybe Arizona. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. For the weather. Yeah, right, for sure. Um, but. You know, I've been kind of keen to the state. I've been asked in the past, for instance, about incentives and this. And I'm not an economist. I've watched things go up and down. Our family is, you know, we were in the automotive business, had automotive concerns. And, you know, the thing that I don't understand, I, I spent time interacting with the Detroit um, uh, economic
economic environment in the 90s when I had a film festival. And, you know, everything was still so tied to all of this and all of that. And then my family and how we were tied to it. Um, I just think that's been such a, a hard uncoupling mm -hmm. of the environment as a whole and diversifying into other things um, that when we started to actually, you know, look at our, our efficiencies and how we do business and, and moving a lot of our labor away, it really fractured, you know, just dramatically. And, and hopefully, though, for instance, with Detroit, a lot of the artistic endeavors that are taking place, a lot of the push for this culture, um, culture is, you know, hard to do. It's usually expensive. There's money, whether it's art, this and that. But when you have a really depressed environment like that, that needs some help, that's like the first thing and the greatest thing that can help it. It's like they, they, they need each other. You know, the city needs that kind of vibrant stuff and these vibrant people need a place that's inexpensive to like, you know, go to. But I just hope Detroit doesn't get too expensive too quick before it can really heal itself because it needs to have a great deal. And we spend a lot of time in a lot of cities uh, Houston, Detroit, you talk about danger. We don't think about it. We don't. We just kind of do it. We interact. We try to be true about what's going on. A couple of times we've run really quickly out of situations. But, you know, Detroit's huge. You know, it's a big place. And, and there's a lot of people that are missing from it. And it's got a lot of healing to do. Um, the surrounding area is very vibrant. You know, Oakland County, for the longest period of time, was the third wealthiest county in the country. You know, so. Uh, you know, we appreciate you being in the area, industry like yourself. I, and, you know, if I'm going to be here, mm -hmm. Ann Arbor is totally the place to be. I love Ann Arbor, I love Grand Rapids, I love Traverse City, mm -hmm. but, but here I love Ann Arbor. The vibe is just great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, do we have any questions from anyone in the audience about making documentary films or anything else you want to ask them? What's your name? Hi, I'm Kelsey. Kelsey? Oh, I don't need a microphone. Yeah, you do. I'm just loud. Kelsey, there's a whole bunch of other people all over the world that are actually paying attention Hello. to what we're doing. What's your full name again? Uh, my name's Kelsey Snyder. Thanks That's for coming. Cool. This is super interesting. I'm thinking what you're laying down. Um, so I was just curious. You mentioned that you've done work for Animal Planet and Nat Geo. Um, you worked with Bruce Campbell. I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more about like how how something like getting a show on Animal Planet works, or a lot of the shows on those types of channels from independent filmmakers? No, and, and it's not really easy to do from an independent sense because a lot of the big brands definitely have uh, a specific look and feel. For instance, right now, um, you know, Fox, you know, is a huge investment in, in Nat Geo and the National Geographic properties, and that's all shifting and changing. You know, they definitely wanted some of the brand, but it's going to, you know, it's, it has its kind of look and feel. When you look across the different brands, they all have their kind of distinct look and feel. I'm really good with the fact that Animal Planet is what it is right now, Nat Geo is what it is right now, because for me, it's a huge opportunity, because it's, it's, a, it's a massive um, market niche that is tremendously underserved. You're putting treehouse and mermaid shows and stuff like that on Animal Planet, or you know the River Monster. He's interesting, but but you know it's it's all you know it's it's just tiddling. There's a certain aspect to it, and we're not really getting anything you know of substance out of it. You know, and that's the thing. How do you for us, for us? It's always how do we get something to go viral? You know, so you do some some bait clicky type thing, but you also have something that's really like juicy behind it. You know, um, it is very hard for independents to um, get into that environment. Um, you need to generally partner with an existing uh, entity. Um, we're we're looking at partners. We're we're looking to storm these gates in a lot of different ways. So. Um, we're looking for our own content to stand on its own and to have a viral capability and to start to build a brand. It's really important for us to have subscribers because these are leverage points. We get carried in more places if we ourselves have more YouTube subscribers. And so that gives me the opportunity to also have leverage in terms of setting meeting. Hey, you know, we have a million people that tune into us every time. And we're not just showing funny cat videos, but we're actually got a, a meaningful piece behind this. Um, 
you know, so, so there's that. Then you're developing relationships with potentially production partner companies that are already putting out content, that are already being asked to look at other content. This is where the, the show with the girls and technology and so on comes in. So they're looking for, you know, someone to take on and put together a, a sizzle for, you know, this concept because they're already looking for it. So there's already a little bit of a door open up. Um, you know, and then and that's depending on the, um, you know, some of the other things that you, you might do and, and maybe spin-offs that, that may take place. Um, and American Opera led to two shows that I did in Canada in 2009, Comic Fee's Rescue Journal um, and Rock and Roll Dogs, kind of, we, we were using dogs and spoofing them, they were making people sound like idiots. It was kind of fun. Um, you know, so it, 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 it depends. But right now, I'm trying to not be beholden to any entity where we have to look and feel like them. Because I don't like a lot of the stuff that we see on Animal Planet. It, 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 it doesn't hold my attention. I, I want to know more what's going on. And the fact that we have, look, HBO has changed the game because they said, we're going to just go direct. We can, we can host this stuff. We're going to run our own you know, pay gate, and you're just going to come to us, and you're going to pay us, and you're going to run through your own internet, wherever that may be, and you can watch our content. Well, they changed the game. That's what basically YouTube is doing, and we're playing YouTube, and so we're doing the same thing as HBO right now. Everybody that's connected to the internet is my audience. That's one of the reasons I wanted to put world in the name of it, because I never saw it. We, you know, push a lot into um, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, India, because these are massive populations too. So, um, you know, it all plays into it. But I see, I, so I see these really power brokers. For me, it is a great time to be a content producer. You know, the last couple of years it's been great being a, a curator. You know, um, I know Scott DeLong. Scott DeLong just sold, um, you know, Viral Nova for $100 million after setting that up for a couple of years, and that's a big click you know, curatorial, we put something, they carried a lot of our stuff that went well. Um, little Things is the same kind of way, came out of pet flow. The curatorial side, though, is now creating this hunger for more content, you know, and they want videos. Video is king. We're looking at partnerships, similar to Vice. So Vice puts out content, they've got their people that they serve, but because they have a large base, they also have these commercial partners that they're making content for and now these the different relationships. So it's changing. And the one thing that's really great about today and the tools and places like YouTube and Google is it absolutely allows a small outfit like us to have a bigger footprint and to start to play and let our content get out there and bang. And, and then it's about you know grabbing as many eyeballs as possible. And it's not about, although we'd like to have the broadcast relationship, we'll do that. They're going to be on our terms because we're going to build the foundation enough that they're going to want to deal with us, have our, you know, partnerships, and you know, we're going to be getting into, you know, some of the content that we get into, and we're starting to do things better than people in our realm, too, so. But it's a, it's a, it's a new day, and they're all kind of, like, shifting to go, but I'm doing the same thing as HBO, right now. So it's almost sounds like the power has shifted quite a bit from Absolutely. the big networks to the content creators like yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, Tom, I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. Okay. I've learned a lot about what you do in filmmaking, and I think all of us appreciate the storytelling and the cause for the World Animal Awareness Society. Um, what is another way that viewers can help your cause? To subscribe to your YouTube channel, to donate? Yeah, to absolutely. And all that stuff comes from going to the front page, wa2s.org. And there is um, jumping points to either Google Plus or Facebook or YouTube. It would be great to have everyone be a YouTube subscriber who's interested in their content. If there's a program that you're interested in, there's plenty of ways to donate. We have ways that people can volunteer too, and there's a volunteer component. And um, there's lots of stuff that can be done from anywhere in the world to volunteer and to help with us. And I appreciate you, Mark, as a volunteer, doing what you do and helping us make the connection. Uh, we've just recently gone, as you know, from a Google ad nonprofit uh, partner to a nonprofit pro partner, and you helped us set up with someone here in, in, uh, 
in Ann Arbor that's helping us drive that, which is really, you know, Mondo great, and so I appreciate that. Google has been exceptional to us. The YouTube partnership has been, I, I mean, I can't even describe it enough. The one thing I want to, the last thing I want to say to you, I am very excited for you and this new project, this side project that we have coming up um, with the horses and everything, and you might be able to get a chance to be on camera yourself more. Oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about it. Sure. Well, thanks again for joining us, Tom, and thanks uh, for everyone. This is Toxic Google. I'm Mark Deschwinitz and Tom McPhee. Thank you. Let's give them a